Welcome to the Free Range Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Livermore. This episode is sponsored by the program on law, communities, and the environment at the University of Virginia School of Law. With me today is Rich Schrager, my colleague here at UVA Law, who is a leading expert on local government, federalism, and urban policy, among other areas. Uh, he's also the author of the book, City Power, Urban Governance in a Global Age. Rich, thanks for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me, Mike. So maybe as a starting place, we could actually just begin with this idea of city power, uh, which has really been an ongoing concern of yours for for a number of years. Yeah, what 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 is this this idea of city power, and and why should we care about it? Well, um, uh, that's a good question. A lot of my colleagues often don't think about cities, especially in law schools, where we talk a lot about the Supreme Court and Congress mm-hmm. and other institutions that are at the national level. But you know, I've been teaching local government law and other uh, sort of locally related classes, urban law and policy, and land use uh, for for many, many uh, years, almost two decades at this point. And um, I've been um, an advocate for thinking much more about local power than uh, than we often do in, in our law schools. City Power is a book um, that... Um, brings together a lot of the work I had done prior to uh, pulling it together. Um, and it really is meant to challenge the, 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 the usual narrative that we often have about local governments and in particular cities, um, that they are either um, not able to really control their economic and fiscal fates. Mm-hmm. That is that they are susceptible to people just fleeing them and therefore they have to engage in policies that attract and retain uh, residents and firms and businesses. And the way they do that is usually through providing certain kinds of amenities to people or tax breaks to firms or they have to have a biz- business friendly environment or so on. So there's a view of cities that they, they're really constrained by kind of large scale economic forces. And then there's a, 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 a companion view of cities that they're corrupt, that they're badly managed, that they need oversight either by the state governments or by the national government. And I've been pushing against those two narratives for a very long time. Hmm. Um, so, so one question that kind of came up, and and you talk about this quite a bit in the book, and so, um, you know, I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. So, so, right as you were saying, there's this long literature, and there's a lot of influential thinking that cities, in a sense, are like highly constrained. And you talk about this idea of cities as products, right? That some way that um, city governments are selling a suite of policies, um, amenities that they provide, a set of tax policies that go along with those amenities. And then the market is the market for capital, like who's going to locate their, you know, in the old days we would say factories, (laughs) but you know, whatever capital stuff uh, that we're moving around. And then for for workers and for residents and for retirees or for whatever else. and that, you know, as you say, that's a very influential view. And it seems like there's two parts of it. So one is the existence of that market, that there are markets for capital and for people, um, and that cities are in that market in some general sense. And then there's kind of a second view, which is about what the ideal set of policies are that are going to uh, kind of arise out of that market or that cities are going to be more successful with. And it seems like those aren't necessarily this, the same, that like there could be a market, but it, you know, what people's views about what that suite of policies are could be mistaken. So, so which, so you, you're, you're arguing against the standard view. So which part of that view are you arguing against? Is it that cities aren't really in this competition and it actually doesn't matter too much what they do um, in the, in the sense that people and firms will locate one way or the other kind of irrespective of what cities are up to, or is it that, you know, maybe the standard, uh, you know, understanding of what the suite of policies are that is most likely to benefit cities in terms of attracting capital and labor. We've got that wrong. Yeah. So it's 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 great question. Um, it's a it's it's a little bit of both. Although the former, and this is where it gets a little um, it's it's a little unconventional kind of argument. The the argument that um, f- uh, ver- various folks have articulated in this various ways, but the argument that um, 
uh, businesses, a factory or a, or a firm or individuals essentially look out into the world and, um, and then uh, uh, make a location decision as mm-hmm. if they were consumers in, the, in, the, in, a, in a general marketplace is quite powerful, as you've, as you've said. And it comes out of literature from uh, uh, Tebow, who this guy said, you know, people vote with their feet. They, mm-hmm. they decide they're going to move to, say, into the city or into the suburbs or into a particular metropolitan area. Um, uh, and they do so in part, at least, based on the available uh, amenities in those places, including presumably what kind of tax rate uh, mm-hmm. is in that place and what, what kinds of things you get in exchange for that tax rate, like good schools or other kinds of things like that. Um, and this this can explain some level. It's called we might call it sorting or something else. Right. There's there's a beneficial aspect to this, which is everybody gets what they want. They go and this is the this is the benefit of decentralized local government, which is people vote with their feet, and then people's preferences are are obtained by their location choices. So there's the book talks about how some of these things are uh, that some of this is mistaken. The first mistake is to mistake that sorting. Mm-hmm. for a theory of economic growth. So they're not the same thing. So what we what we might say is, well, people sort into various things, and then we often move very quickly to saying, well, this, the city that's deindustrializing or a city that's losing population, well, they've, they've failed in this consumer chase, this mm-hmm. hunt for, 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 for businesses or, or residents. And that failure is why they're declining, say, economically in space, right? Because that's what a, a city, we're not sure what a city is. A city is presumably the activity of the people in a particular location, in, right. in a particular spatial location. And so we've made a mistake sometimes in, in assuming that economic growth and, a tr- and, and residential sorting or or firm sorting is the same thing. And they're not. We actually don't have great theories about economic growth in the world. We think we know sometimes what causes economic growth, but we don't we we we, we should have some some modesty about that. And I think that applies to cities and metropolitan areas as well. So one thing I say in the book is we should be skeptical of claims that a city has failed because it it's losing population. You 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 might say about that, oh, they've just failed to provide the kinds of goods and services and tax rates that attract people, and therefore mm-hmm. they're losing population. But a different account is we've got uh, we've got um, a, a mystery of economic growth. How does economic growth happen in a place, which usually is accompanied by population? It doesn't have to be accompanied by increased population, but normally is. How, what are the mysteries of economic growth? And it turns out economic geographers aren't are have other accounts that have nothing to do with sorting among consumers making location preferences. So I think that's a mistake and what that mistake leads to is folks saying you should be doing this this and this, right? You should have a great downtown business right. district and arts and and all all these amenities and all these great things you should have more bars and more restaurants that are open later right. and a nightlife and a and a and a football team and a baseball and that'll make your city great and it turns out all cities are doing all of those things all the time but it doesn't actually change outcomes over time and so we should stop doing that we should right. stop pursuing a bunch of fads this is a, at at the local pause and this goes to your second part a bunch of fads which is oh we'll build a downtown mall that'll attract new people we'll we'll put in uh you know we'll put in a stadium that'll attract new people and we often make mistakes thinking that the thing we did caused the say the uptick in population right. or the or 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 on the other side a down a, a, a downward spiral in, in population so we make mistakes by saying well the problem with detroit's decline was bad management they just didn't do invest in the right kinds of things mm-hmm. and then on the other side we say oh the the resurgence of new york city and the resurgence of all these cities actually all over the globe is is because they made some other kinds of choices well it turns out 
no one predicted the urban resurgence of the last two decades right. or more. And the reason they didn't predict it is because we actually don't have any idea what has caused the urban resurgence. We still don't know. Right. And so the book addresses this too. So I think the 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 argument of the book is a little bit complicated in the following sense is is it says you can't in fact control these things that you think you can but you can control some other things and the other things you can do is just provide good municipal services even when you're in an economic downturn you might need help from other levels of government to do that but in fact we're going to see booms and busts in 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 cities um, and we've seen that all throughout history and to attribute false causes to those booms and busts is a real mistake. Yeah. Super interesting. And just to kind of clarify, when you talk about a city failing, I think what I take that to mean is actually the city government failing in some sense, like cities go up, as you said, there's kind of, you know, there's growth, there's decline. And I guess one question is, do you think that those, those are really policy independent processes, like say city policy, yeah, independent processes, or is it just that we don't know what the? Because I take the point <laughs> right. that we don't know what the policies are that contribute to or you know detract from growth. Although I can imagine, because part of it is like I can. There's got to be policies that would be bad for economic growth. Right. You know, like I mean, if you just like what their policy is going to be is we're going to like tear down every single building or not allow a single thing to get built or have tax rates of fifty percent of income or whatever. Like that's not going to be good for that's not going to be good for economic growth, right? But within the you know kind of on the margins or it, within the policy space of what we kind of think of as like reasonable you know policies that a cities might actually adopt. We, maybe we don't have much of an idea about what actually contributes to growth or not. But I guess, yeah, so the question back to you is, do you think it's a, it's an epistemic issue that we, <laughs> we don't know what the answer is? Or is it literally, it could just be independent? Like, you know, it's like a, a sickness, like to a certain extent that's under my control, but I can get sick for reasons that are entirely outside of my control as well. Yeah, so I, th I think uh, it... it it may be both, and it's mm. it's really tricky to disentangle. Sure. But it's the super interesting question, which is, and again, I'm not a growth economist, and so I don't have. Uh, we have lots of. There's plenty of theories out there of how you induce growth, say, in a whole continent like Africa, right. or in countries in a continent, or it, so it's at every scale. There's lots of questions about how we do this, and then policy does follow from that. So actually, you got to get your debt under control, or you right. can't be protectionist, or right. the Washington consensus. And then we find out, well, that didn't really work very well. And theories of other, other theories of growth, democracies are going to grow faster, let's say, than author, authoritarian regimes. But then you you get counterexamples. Federal systems will grow better than uh, centralized systems, but of course, then you get you get counterexamples to that too. So I think when we're talking about the relationship between institutions and growth, there is a strong argument that, uh, or a strong uh, a strong group of scholars who say institutions really matter for growth a lot, right? Whether you're whether you're you've got in, uh, uh, institutions of private property, right? I know North Korea doesn't look like it's been doing right. a great doesn't job. Doesn't do, look like it's doing a great job. But within a, and I agree, within a range though, it's not entirely clear, right, that this is what's doing the work. So the relationship between institutions and growth is, I think, quite a fraught one, despite some very optimistic kind of views on this or very strong views on this. My own view is institutions and growth have they're going to have some relationship and the question is at what scale so what's interesting is right jane jacobs uh the famous urbanist right um patron is, saint of the book patron saint of the book for for <laughs> sure she's she's she appears many many times over as as she does for many urban you know urbanists who've been influenced by her work um you know she had a she she was trying to write about cities right in um in much of her work and a lot of um a, um um a lot of her work is not um as uh as read as um her her most famous book which is the the death and life of great american cities but um she also wrote uh uh 
books like The Cities and the Wealth of Nations, right, and some of these other other later books. And she was trying to figure out what generates growth, actually, I think, at the end of the day. And uh, economists have come to appreciate some of her insights, which was one of which is uh, this idea of um, agglomeration or externalities of the fact that the space in the city generates knowledge between industries and between the same industry, um, and that generates knowledge that leads to economic de- uh, development. Mm-hmm. And those Jane Jacobs externalities have been um, have been recognized in some ways, or that's how they've been called by by economists. So her her account, and it was an attempt again to look at growth, was that if you have a, a and this was at the at the very lowest level, at the neighborhood level, at the block level, at the street level. If you have a diversity of uses, a mixture of of types of industry, of types of small business, of types of people, of types of housing, that will generate a vibrant and um, and economically uh, dynamic place, which she called the city. So she said the city is where this happens. This is where economic growth happens, not in not in regions, not in the hinterlands, not in rural areas, but in cities. And the city does this work. And so there is uh, a kind of theory of growth that is is quite closely connected with the nature of the city itself that does inform my book uh, on city power but I don't I don't feel like I need to um, endorse it wholeheartedly I'm sympathetic to it but I think it's enough to say hey those traditional those conventional things you think you're supposed to do are are really not really in your control and so, in fact, you should be doing some other things. So, yeah, so that actually sounds like a different thing. <laughs> that yeah. sounds like there are things that that cities can do. It's just that it's not what we think that they are. So this, this, yeah, again, this kind of strikes me as the as a as a as a tension in some way in the, in the argument that because on the one hand, it could be that these are just policy independent processes, right? Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. you know that you've. You know, Detroit maybe is an example of there's just globalization and trade and none of that is under Detroit's control. Like maybe it's not policy independent in the sense that like, you know, trade policy is part of the picture. But there's just these big systems, you know, systemic things happening at regional, national and global levels that are, you know, bad for Detroit or, you know, climate change is, you know, in 100 years, Phoenix and Tucson and Miami might not look as vibrant as they look today, right? And it's not because of anything that had to do with the management of those in particular cities. It's just that, like, Miami's underwater, and you know, right, right. Phoenix is, like, 150 degrees. Right. So right. I was not going to be that much, but it will be hot. a oh, heck of a lot hotter. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so there's that. that, that these are just their processes that are, uh, you know, kind of pol- policy independent in the sense of at that scale, at the scale of the city. But on yeah. the other hand, you know, the, the argument that you were just providing is more like, well, no, we could, if we create these vibrant and diverse communities that have certain characteristics, that's actually going to lead to, to development. I, you know, growth is a funny word because that usually yeah. just means like GDP. Let's just say development in a positive sense, right? Yep. Yep. And so that's actually very policy oriented. And there's all kinds of policies that we could do to disrupt that um, that process from happening. There's things that we could do to foster that from happening. So is it just that, so where's the mistake is, is or is it just a, it's a mix of mistakes. <laughs> it's so, a, a lot, yeah, yeah so, it's, so go ahead. It's totally fair. And I think, um, I try to capture this in the first chapter of the book by talking about a number of, of ways. And we actually do this constantly and we do it in one sentence. We'll mix different accounts. Mm-hmm. So one account is, um, as you pointed out, the city is a product in the location marketplace or mm-hmm. the local government marketplace, and you can improve your product, and then you get consumers. They walk around, and they get the they get the product they want, and if you do a good job, you get more population and more wealth, and if you do a bad job, uh, the opposite happens. And when we talk about cities declining because of corruption or bad government, that's partially what we're we, we're suggesting. That's the kind of claim we're making. Like they made a mistake or they taxed the wrong people or they 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 made an error or or, or the governor or the mayor, sorry, was um, 
was corrupt. Or that could also be attributed to some other level of government, right? You could say, well, in this, uh, the legislature did some bad things or Congress did some bad things and that affected the city too. So it doesn't mm-hmm. have to be them, but it's still a product, conception of the city as a product. Another conception of the city, which you've art- articulated also, is as a byproduct of large scale social forces. One of those might be just technology. So one of the big ones is for folks who look at the growth of cities, they say air conditioning, big deal for the Sun Belt. Automobile, huge, right? Affects the city, allowed for the the dispersal of people outside the city. Uh, The internet, uh, IT is a huge thing that people say, well, this is a structural force that allows for the dispersal of of people because now they can they can live wherever they want right and once you've once you've reduced uh, once you've reduced uh, transportation and communication costs to zero or close to zero you you're not going to have cities anymore now yeah. the problem with the just to say the problem I've talked a little bit about the problem with the product product account the byproduct account is also just often uh, just often um, wrong, right? So if it's true that the IT revolution should allow people to live wherever they want, then our cities should have declined in the in the first half of the 20th century. And in fact, they, they their populations tended to stabilize or increase. And again, well, this not, could be, sorry to interrupt, but th- yeah, that yeah. could be, that's not necessarily a ding on the byproduct theory in general. That's just a ding on a particular... A certain application. Right. Yeah. Um, so... But the, the 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 fact that we're not quite sure what the effects of a certain technology are mm-hmm. on that suggests to me that our our accounts are still pretty primitive, right? Mm-hmm. So another account would be oh the um, uh, and this is you often see this uh, cities developed where uh, at the at the terminus of railroads mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. roads. This is, a, this is this seems obvious because when you look at the map, you see cities. Right. At the term, but it turns out there are lots of cities that could have been at the at, right. at those locations. And Jacobs points this out in one of her books. He's like there there were hundreds of cities that had deep water ports or had or or could have been placed in in a perfectly uh, fine place for uh, railroad transportation. And certain ones did, and certain ones did not. Right. Uh, uh, come to be and, and survive. And if you look at the competition between Chicago and St. Louis, um, often there's a bunch of accounts that, that say, well, the reason Chicago wins is because of X, Y, and Z. But it turns out none of that is clear, except mm. in hindsight. And that's especially true of our more recent accounts of how cities have come back. So, for example, New York City in the 70s, you wouldn't have bet on New York City real estate in the 70s when the city is in dramatic decline in lots of ways, maybe overstated, actually, but in a budget budgetary crisis and a fiscal crisis. And and. And now, then you have to tell a new story as to why, in in 2022, the city has the just the 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 value of housing in the city so and land is so high. So there's some stories that we tell, but they're they're quite incomplete on the byproduct. Mm-hmm. So how do I solve all this? I don't really. So to be fair, I think we should be modest. I I I like the account of the city as a process Mm -hmm. to try to think about it not as a product or as a byproduct of technological factors but and this borrows again from jacobs um as a kind of organic um uh, a kind of organic uh phenomena which occur and i think the economic the economic geographers have some of this I- embedded into their models of how city populations rise and fall or how city growth rises and fall. And it's complicated. It's complicated, but it's, it's, I think we make mistakes when we, when we, when maybe we use the wrong analogies. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. And as you were, you were kind of just t- talking through this, one way to maybe let me just run this by you to see if it, it works is, you know, there's the city as the process, and that's obviously a very open textured description of a thing <laughs> as <Yes>. a process. <laughs> but one, th- you know, and again, trying to think about the relationship of, you know, kind of policy independent stuff that's happening versus, you know, stuff that does depend on policy and so on is, you know, in some ways kind of we could abstract away from the markets that the markets in a certain sense that cities are embedded in. Like we could say, okay, let's imagine that cities 
have a fixed amount of capital and a fi- and their, their existing population, and that that firms can't leave and they can't enter, and that people can't leave and they can't enter, like just as an abstraction. Mm-hmm. And then you've got cities like that, and you have different policies in in different cities, right? Yeah. As a consequence of those different policies, there will be differences in outcomes, or at least in in theory, there could be differences in outcomes, right? So it would be like if a city said, our policy is, you know, we're going to do zoning such that, you know, there's just going to be a neighborhood of hospitals and a neighborhood of schools and a neighborhood of residences, and we're going to separate everything out into different zones. And then there's another city that says, we're going to integrate everything, and there's going to be, you know, commercial, mixed-use residential, education embedded, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And that those different – people can't move, right? So it's, right. this isn't a Tebow thing, right? Yeah. This is just, you know, we've got these different ways of structuring cities, and that – it sounds like on your theory that could have consequences for how the cities develop over time. Um, it's it's not going to be through this sorting mechanism, but it'll be through this more like processed organic kind of mechanism. So I think it's plausible. I, the, 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 the thing is that, um, um, and again, this is Jacobs is that cities and, and, um, and the way I like to think about them is that cities have these effects over long distances. So a closed system is is almost um, antithetical to the definition <laughs> in a way, right? Because materials are being brought in, trade is happening, right? Inside and outside the city. Um, um, you, c- you could have a kind of a closed system, but then you're playing a game. You're playing like a monopoly game or like a board game. And this, like things, games like SimCity appear like this. You put up your stuff and you make, then, then you, you hope that your city survives. Mm-hmm. And in fact... The, in those kinds of games, sometimes your city, you make the bad, the bad land use choice and the city declines, right? <laughs> you make the good land use choice and the city prospers. It's a closed system. But of course, no city is really a closed system. And um, in fact, uh, almost definitionally, a city is, is having uh, um, effects well beyond its borders mm-hmm. in lots of different environmentally of course we know that they're taking water and supplies and food from the hinterlands and bringing them in certain kinds of regions are doing and then trade and then they're inventing things in cities lots of invention goes on in cities and those inventions are being used to make more efficient agriculture outside the city so it's very hard to talk about a closed system it's something we're inclined to do because we want to isolate the the kind of policies, yeah. but I, I, you know, I'm going to resist that a little bit for, uh, 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 because I think it is a little bit antithetical to the, to the, the, the nature of the, of right. Another way to think about this is urbanization is just a phenomenon, right? So we could just talk about urbanization and then we don't have a city necessarily or a suburb or a rural area. We just have a kind of a, uh, 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 sociological phenomena, and then we can talk about well, when do we see urbanization, when do we not? And certainly, we can we have theories about that too. But again, a lot of this is um, using analogies that don't quite match up with um, what we see in the real world. Yes. Well, okay. So, so then, <laughs> so then maybe this does take us back to. So I keep going back to the you know flipping between these different positions, yeah. which is that it doesn't matter what cities do. Like city policies could be whatever. It's like literally, they could just be whatever they are, whatever. Like we could throw darts (laughs) at a policy (laughs) dartboard and like it's just has, will have no effects on development in a city um, because there's just, it's just other, because there's other processes that, because policy just isn't an input into that output, I guess, right? That's uh, that would be the the thing. Yeah, that's the the strong claim would be no policies. I I don't think I would embrace the strongest claim because as you as you point out, you know, if you expropriate everybody's land and you <laughs> right tell them He's to gonna shoot everybody, right, I mean, if like, you shoot everybody, that's a policy. Like we could be, <laughs> right? we could be and. 
part of it is how do you define what we're talking about, right? So the uh-huh. city is the city, the people in the city, the city, yeah, the I mean, firms sure. in the city. Is it right. just the value of the land, the dirt in the city? Is mm-hmm. it the city government? And we often mix those up too. Right. But say we could do, we could probably, I mean, there might be different ways of talking about something like that, but presumably we could get at least a passable definition so that we could at least yes. have a conversation. Yeah, yes, yeah. certainly, certainly. So again, I again, I'm I'm, I'm not resistant to the to the strong form of the argument. I think I am uh, resistant to the weak form of the argument, which is that specific policies will have, um, um, well, I think, in terms of economic growth, and let, let me be really clear about this, I think we're still not quite sure what does it. The urban... right. It sounds actually more and more that we're radically unsure about what does it. Yeah, I think that's right. If we knew, If we knew even a bit mm-hmm. about it, we would actually uh, have predicted the urban resurgence. Or someone would have said, "Yeah, in twenty years, thirty years, this will this will come to pass." Detroit will, uh, and it, we would have we would have been able to predict maybe the decline too, right? So, nineteen fifties, Detroit has the largest population in the United States, or one of the largest, and is the is the, just the leading edge of the leading technology of the time, right. which is the automobile. And now we turn around fifty, seventy five years later, and um, and the population of the city is half that or less, and mm-hmm. uh, the wealth is certainly um, is 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 certainly less. So we we would be able to make some some claims about that, and I just don't think we're we're capable of doing that now. What do I see? Say the city can do well. The city can engage in, therefore, and should. And now we're talking about within a range of policies, right? I don't want them to shoot everybody. Or I don't want them. Can pursue um, instead of pursuing growth, right? Which seems like a vain and and costly enterprise with a lot of mistakes for lots of for the reasons you've stated. But um, it may be because we don't know how to do it, or because. Um, um, it, it, nothing we do can have an effect. And I, again, I'm going to toggle between those a little bit. But what we can do is provide basic municipal services well to the people that exist in that place, right? right. As a matter of social justice, not as a matter of growth seeking, the problem, and this is, gets back to the thesis of the book, the problem is that we think of cities as mostly uh, as mostly agents that are supposed to be growth seeking, not justice seeking, and that just seems like a terrible mistake. Yeah, no, I think it's a, a really interesting move, right? From to go from where we're what we were just talking about, which is the you know the lack of autonomy in a sense, or the lack of agency, the inability yeah. to influence this feature that's very important, which is economic growth. Uh, again, either for epistemic reasons or for, um, you know, just because the structure of things. But you actually see this as liberating. Yes, as <laughs> as, right. as as unleashing city power. Correct. It's actually the inability to affect growth that is that is liberating. So yeah, how do you, how do you make that move? And then yeah, you know, what are what are some what are some of the areas that you see is this kind of this new this new this new power, this new liberty um, yeah. you know, being important. Well, because what it does is it, uh, by saying, listen, we don't have, the, we don't have very much control over growth uh, or at least growth seeking seems like a pretty challenging task uh, for, for all the reasons we've stated. And we should be modest about that. The, by the same token, the policies that folks say are going to retard growth are also not proven, Right. And so that means that cities are liberated to do some of the policies that folks would have said they can't do, like redistribution. So folks would say you can't tax people or impose a minimum wage or lots of other things um, because the the wealthy residents or firms or businesses will just uh, move across the border. They'll move right. from the city into the suburbs, uh, or they'll move, you know, out of Detroit to, you know, to to someplace else. And um, and this is this is the common view of the limited city. And um, city power is kind of a play on uh, a, a book from the '80s by Paul Peterson called City Limits. Hmm. Which basically made this argument that the, there's no way the city, because it's a territorially defined uh, jurisdiction that doesn't have control outside of it to any extent, 
Um, the territorially defined city can't redistribute. It can't do very much at all in terms of moving moving resources around. What they can fight about in the city is developmental spending, essentially. And that's sometimes that's, you know, that's a fight, but it's not that important important. They're all kind of headed in the same direction. And this explained in part why the politics of the city was so focused on things like land use and mm. and, and 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 the business community, right? Mm-hmm. You needed the business community on board to get the city, blah, 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 blah. So, um, so I'm I, the liberating part, and you, you make the point nicely, is that you can also do policies that they would have said will hurt your city, and that's not going to hurt your city either. And one of those policies might be, for example, adopting a minimum wage, right, right. For, or a living wage or environmental legislation or regulation or so on. And we've seen cities do that and not lose population. We've also seen and continue to see differentials in tax rates between cities and suburbs, and the cities are thriving in high-tax jurisdictions. Now, it might be because... Those residents have a preference for high tax jurisdictions or so on. But it also just might be that those policies don't actually have the effects on growth that, that folks had, had thought they they would have. Yeah, great. And so um, there's a couple of things I wanted to kind of jump off from from there. But maybe one just to kind of – maybe this is kind of still setting the stage a little bit is – you know, there's intercity competition and there's intra-city competition. Again, depending on how we define a city. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but you know that border that you were talking about. Um, yeah. it, it actually seems it's it's and you know in a portion of the book you talk about this a, a fair amount is yeah. that is that does seem like there's some action at, at that border that that yeah. firms or individuals locate on one side or another. I mean, certainly people locate where the to where they think schools are good within a jurisdiction or across jurisdictions. Um, you know, firms may move within within a municipal catchment basin, or whatever, yeah, right, uh, you know, whatever right, we right. would say, yeah. where you're getting those, you know, uh, aggregation benefits, you know, yeah. you're, you're around, you're in the exciting, fun metropolitan area, but if yeah. you can be in the exciting, fun metropolitan area and take a, you know, avoid a 10% income tax right. uh, by, by moving two blocks, right? A lot of people are going to, at least there's going to be some pressure to do that. So yes, is what's up with that? Like, how, how do you um, think about the distinction between intercity versus intracity competition? And because um, because you were just saying, you know, you can, you seem to be able to persist with some higher tax rates in metropolitan areas, but that doesn't necessarily mean that nobody's moving to the suburbs, right, right. Um, you know, because of how we've drawn these lines. Yeah. So I think, I think, um, yeah, to be careful about this, I you know, the lines matter, certainly. And for a long time and when I teach local government law and 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 we 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 talk a lot about the line between the city and the suburb and the 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 ability to flee um, flee juris- the jurisdiction. Um, we talk a lot about um, annexation and the, the ability for a city to grow in, in its borders so that it has more taxable land. There's some basic, there's some basic facts, which is a city uh, only really gets to tax its, um, uh, in many cases, its, its, its main revenue source is a property tax, and the property tax is just what's in the jurisdiction. You, you increase the jurisdiction, you got more property tax. You limit the jurisdiction, you've got less. That also is, uh, is the case for the, the amount of population population in the city. Your city's um, constrained in its borders. The city, qua city, is now um, um, constrained in, in, um, in its jurisdiction. That doesn't mean that the metropolitan area can't be understood as a big city, right? It's the lines between these jurisdictions are usually invisible to mm-hmm. most of us um, as we cross them, which we do regularly when we live in a metropolitan area. And um, and and in fact, might, there might not be any physical difference for some time when you cross into an into another place. Yep. Um, so um, I think there is there is some sorting certainly that's going on in these places. Somebody might be like, "Well, we lived in a in a in an apartment in the city, and we've decided to move to the suburbs because we want more space." As people right? say, yeah. Um, or we or we we're moving for schools and so on. That you know, I think that that it's plausible to talk in those terms and and. And cities have to think about those things. But again, what the urban resurgence proved to us was those factors aren't as as big or even 
close to being as significant as as other things that we we have not been able to identify. So, for example, folks were saying for a long time, you have to improve the schools in the city before people will move mm-hmm. back to the city, right? You have to improve the schools. That's got to be the first thing. That's got to precede population shifts into the city. And mm-hmm. we just haven't seen that. It's not that schools got really great. And then that attracted yeah. suburbanites back into the city. It's that, in fact, lots of people started to move into the city or or, or start stay. to stay in the city. And then the schools improved thereafter, which actually, when you think about it, makes a certain amount of sense. Um, because um, if you had highly segregated, poor schools, once you start to... to um, have have a, a little bit more diversity in terms of incomes and so on. The schools are gonna are gonna are, are probably gonna get better. Um, um, so I think um, I think when when we look at the causes of either population increase or decrease in cities, we, again as I've been saying, we often look at the wrong thing and then we attribute it to other things like crime. For example, we say well cr- they crime went down and that's why the cities have uh, now done better or resurging or populations are stabilizing crime's a real problem it's got to be solved it's 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 um it's something that cities should be doing <laughs> is making sure their citizens are safe um uh um but there's not a ton of evidence that shows that there was a crime decline prior to people starting to move back into cities. Mm-hmm. And in fact, in European cities and other places around the globe where there's also been urban resurgence, where people are moving back into the cities, there was never a serious crime problem to begin with in these places. So in fact, it's that can't be the explanation. So uh, part of this is coming at this backwards, which is not from a grand theory, but saying, well, what is our accounts of what you can do and what you can't do, or what causes um, what causes people to make certain kinds of choices. Um, I like to use the example of the downtown mall in Charlottesville in my class. So Charlottesville, small city, quite constrained in its borders, limited taxing ability, um, was in in decline in the 70s, 80s, 90s um, in the way that much larger cities were also in decline, but just on a much smaller scale. People moving out to the suburbs, classic kind of white flight kind of narrative. And they put in a downtown walking pedestrian mall, close off a street in the, in the, um, in the 90s. And then everybody says, that's what resulted in the urban resurgence of Charlottesville. Charlottesville now, much more popular place, stabilized population, high property values in lots of places, lots of demand for downtown living. All of this much different than 20 years before or 25 years before. And then you you point out that the downtown mall that, that Charlottesville did put in place was um, a fad that many cities put in in the 70s and 80s. They all built downtown pedestrian malls trying to compete with the suburbs for people and consumer dollars and so on. And most of those cities took them out after a number of years because they weren't working and it was clear that they were just a waste of time and money. Charlottesville was late to the game, put in its pedestrian mall, and then just didn't have the resources to take it out, not that they were even thinking about it. It just didn't actually cause anything, <laughs> at least in the sh- in the kind of short or medium term. And yet what we do is look at the downtown mall and say, oh, that's that was a cause of the of the resurgence of downtown Charlottesville. In fact, there is a huge gap in time between the downtown mall being put in and any kind of identifiable resurgence in the city. So Again, here's a here's a causal story about policy, right? A specific kind of land use policy, and um, we're often misled because we think we see causation and we don't. Um, great. Yeah. So th- this this kind of gets us back into the, the the prior obsession, but I, I'm I'm super interested in this, so I kind of keep wanting to dig on it, even though there's <laughs> lots of different things that we could talk about, like. Because that's that you know that is a the, almost like a, a classic problem with how we do humans like attribute causes to things right correlations and then they they say causation. Um, how could we you know you're 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 very conversant with the literature on on all this and people have been thinking about all of it for a really long time. Um, 
you know, there's the possibility that these are policy independent, at least within the a range of reasonable policies. Right. There's also the possibility that we just don't know that maybe the mall did. You know, maybe these right, guys right, made right. a mistake by tearing out their malls. Right. Or who knows? Like, we, it's very hard because we, we need a counterfactual of another yes. Charlottesville with the, you know, without a downtown mall. But, you know, these kinds of um, challenges, we, we face them in lots of social scientific con contexts where, you know, we don't know what the effects of different things are in the world. Um, you know, different curricular policies, how to manage schools, how to deal with, you know, prisoner reentry or, you know, crime control or whatever else. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think, you know, we do a terrible job of, of funding and structuring research to actually be able to figure out how, how uh, public policy, you know, and government spending and lots of other things actually do or do not change the world. But what can we learn about, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> is it possible to learn about cities and policies and the kinds of policies that assuming, or, it, you know, or even just find out that there are no policies that matter, or, you know, if there are policies that they do matter, because it, because it could be two options. There, It could be, there's actually th three different possibilities, like uh, maybe more, but three pop to mind. So there's, it's policy independent altogether. That's one possibility. The other one is that it, it matters for policy. Policy matters rather for outcomes, but we just don't know what the answer is, you know, because we haven't done the research. And the other possibility would be that policy matters, but it's so context specific that there's no amount of information that we could ever collect that would give us a reasonable basis for deciding in this particular context, this policy would matter. Right, so right. it matters in a kind of <laughs> counterfactual sense yeah. in a broad way, but like we'll never get to the point where we actually know because things will change. Like by the time we know what's good for, for city policy now in the, you know, Atlantis, Atlantic coast kind of region of the United States with the existing suite of policy, uh, sorry, with the existing suite of technology, like yeah. technology and trade and the global circumstances will have changed such that, all of the knowledge that we had prior is just worthless. Like the same way that like the policies that were a good idea in like 1840, right. which have nothing to do with what's good policy today. Right. So right. Is, is that where, are we just, where it's like the worst of both worlds where it matters what we do, but we can never know, like, <laughs> or even have a reasonable basis right. for making decisions. Well, so <laughs> I'd rather not opine on the, the, the giant question, which is like, can our social science, you know, improve, improve, uh, you know, uh, uh, welfare and global outcomes. I think there are things, right? We know that um, that clean water is really great, right? For um, for Probably. for people's health. Maybe and, I don't know. Maybe you're convincing me, Rich. Maybe right, we don't know. I don't know. Anything. Maybe we need to. But I think <laughs> drinkable water is pretty great. Probably and, good. Uh, and sewage systems and sewages and, uh, are awesome. Yes, that's yeah, true, are pretty yeah. good. Yeah. And so um, having those uh, does improve if we just take a to take you know health outcomes or death mm -hmm. or, or death outcomes cholera uh, right right, yeah, right. Sure. Um, 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 life expectancy and so on and so I you know this this that's a that's that's at the at the macro level at the city level uh, that's basically what I push which is don't try to uh, what what Charlottesville shouldn't have done is say oh we need downtown and maybe politically this is what ends up happening because it often does is oh we need a downtown mall to help get the downtown businesses uh, uh, help the downtown businesses compete with the indoor mall in the suburbs right and um, the indoor mall is taking up all the all the all the all the uh, space here and we need to do something to do that you know my uh, and this goes for lots of kinds of city local based policies land use of various kinds and stadium construction and so and so forth um, also just subsidizing businesses to come in right mm -hmm. industry businesses uh, or industry subsidies are a big huge uh, expenditure and um, and it's there's lots of evidence that they don't work right. so I'm not opposed to 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 looking at evidence, right? I, in fact, cite a lot of evidence in the book, uh, for example, that these industry subsidies don't work. Right. Is, lots, is, lots of evidence that things don't work. Yeah, lots of evidence right. that things don't work. So my my uh, my recommendation to cities is, um, um, if you know, if we're on a clean slate and you, you're you're relatively stable and um, or or um, trying to remain stable as a place with the with the population, invest in the basic. Municipal services that um, that um, improve the lot of the 
the the people that are already there. Mm-hmm. Don't go trying to attract new people or other people. Just invest in the things that um, improve the li- livelihoods and lives of the of the people in place. This is important yeah. because we often, again, I think a lot of our city policies are intended for people that don't live there yet. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because the city right. is like, we got to attract those people because they have to bring tax base and other kinds of goodies to us. And then what ends up happening, and we see this over and over, is that the the poor and the working class basically get chased around the metropolitan region. That mm-hmm. is, there's no place that wants them, and there's no investment in the basic infrastructure that would allow those people to um, have some mobility into the into the middle class, for example, and stay in place, right? This is another thing. We just expect that people, or have in the past at least expected, that people will start in a certain part of the metropolitan region and will move right, right. to other jurisdictions because that's their ladder of life. That's the next stage. Mm-hmm. That's where they're supposed to go. They're supposed to be young and, and not have children in the city. And then they're supposed to move to the suburbs and right. then re- move to a retirement village somewhere. And what we've done is we've got this kind of sorting and segregation segregation that happens. And in fact, that's not what the city should be about in, in any way. It should have a diversity of people, ages, types, um, uh, uh, socioeconomic right. groups. And that, I think, again, going back to Jacobs, is a way you have a diverse, um, robust, and might have, and I don't want to plonk down on this, might have beneficial economic growth effects too right but, but i don't want to commit to that. that i don't and have you could to jettison commit it. to that yeah you, you don't need right? that right uh, you could just say right. you know it's just good because it, i think in a way that's the power of this liberating mo- movement that you make which is to say yes. we don't know or we can't do anything about growth and so let's just do things that we think are good so if we want a mall let's have a mall and it's got right. nothing to do with competing with anybody um and that's the, that's how we should make these decisions, basically. And, and it's interesting because there's always, I think, even for you who are like a very strong, uh, uh, you know, like you, you have as, as strong a, a view on this as, as anybody, probably, there's yeah. still like a little bit that wants to say, mm, but maybe it'll be good for growth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, it's true, right? You get, you get sucked in. And I, I, I said it hesitantly, but, you know, I don't want to say it. I, in fact, right. I want to keep it out. Uh, yeah, it might it be, out. and that's because Jacob says it is right. right she is, right. and I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to throw her under the bus because. Right. Um, so I, I don't want to commit to that though. I don't right. think that's and and it's not the reason to act, right? And, right, that's and, right. So I, I, think I say could... in the book, the reason to act is for justice, not for growth. And and you know, it's possible one day we'll know exactly what's good for growth, and it might be, for example, human capital, right? There, there's education or something yep. like that, or. The liberation of women, I think that's a pretty good thing, right, for growth, or can be. Or is, there's you know, honestly, who knows, be. right? Right. But I think there's something to be maybe. said about who knows, right? Right. Yeah, maybe it's not, but that doesn't – Right. But it wouldn't even provide us a reason with not doing it, though, I don't think. Like, right. especially in certain – It shouldn't like provide us a reason right. for not doing it. And, and again, what's important to me on the city side is that we also shouldn't be constrained by the opposite, which is – the claims about what causes growth are also the claims about what retards growth. And right. those things are often anti-redistributive in, right. in important ways and, and, um, and, and favor uh, – and this is a big part of the book, which we haven't talked that much about – favor mobile capital. Right. Mobile capital being footloose capital and cities are immobile. Mobile capital is all over the globe, and the the idea has always been, or at least a model of what a city is, is that they have to attract that capital. Um, and I'm I'm quite vociferously opposed to that model. So so again, there's a bunch of stuff we could talk about. But I wanted to maybe press on this a little bit more too, just because I you know it is really important. It's kind of the core of a lot of the arguments that you make. So let's talk about redistribution. So yeah. as you note in the book. You know, some cities have engaged in some redistributional measures like um, I think, you know, you talk quite a bit about the, the minimum tax yeah. uh, regimes, living wages and so on. Yeah. So so I'll I'll, I'll uh, disclose my <laughs> my priors on this, <laughs> yeah. which is I see the minimum minimum wage and, 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 and you know, 
that that specific policy yeah. is pretty weak sauce as a redistributional measure. Mm, okay. Um, and the reason I think that is because, well, Jeff Bezos doesn't care what the minimum wage <laughs> right, is. Right, right. And anything that Jeff Bezos <laughs> doesn't care about can't be redistributional. And it's right, right. mostly redistributing between, you know, uh, you know, worker people who rely on minimum wage workers, right? Yep, so yep, you, yep. That, this isn't the richest people in society. Yep. So their prices go up a little bit. And then minimum wage workers, some of them see price, you know, see a wage increase. And, you know, there's always the worry with minimum wage that, that it could lead to some increase in unemployment. There'll be yes. fewer employed people. Now, there's the, the evidence on this is highly mixed. And at the minimum wage levels that we're talking about, um, it doesn't really seem to have much of an effect on employment, right. uh, not much of a measurable effect. Um, and it's not surprising that cities would be able to get away with some m higher minimum wages because wages are higher in cities, right? Because yes. cost of living is higher. And so it's not like super surprising that average, well, average wages in San Francisco are going to be higher than average wages, wages in, you know, rural Alabama. And then, you know, so you can, you can just or even look like the lowest wage, and so you can boost up the the you can boost up the minimum wage in San Francisco yeah, yeah. without as much of a consequence. And I think most people agree that if you were to have a fifty dollar an hour minimum wage, that would probably pretty clearly have a kind of contribute to unemployment. Um, and so there's really a fairly limited amount of redistribution that we can do with the with a you know minimum wage policy, as opposed to things like taxes on billionaires and millionaires that you then use to fund a, uh, mm -hmm. a, a universal basic income or a yep. wealth tax yep. or you know a really serious kind of value added tax again that then is used to fund you know uh, wage support or UBI or uh, earned income tax credit or a suite of other really serious you know uh, housing subsidies, you know, food subsidies, energy subsidies, whatever you want to do that could actually take a big chunk of money from the wealthiest people in society and move it over to the poorest people in society, right? That's what I think of as serious redistributional policy, which yeah, yeah. minimum wage is a pretty far cry from. And so I guess the question is, how constrained, you know, if cities are really liberated, in the way you're describing, are they that liberated <laughs> that yeah. they could start to do that kind of stuff? Because I, the, the minimum wage, you know, I, I get that some people would say, oh, they can't even do that. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's not, it's not the big, I, you know, the, the, I don't know, like the, it's not the big hammer. Yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering <laughs> if, if can cities reach for the big hammer or are they, or, or are they really at the end of the day, just have to reach for the little tiny hammer and tap away, um, as opposed to really go after the the you know yeah. major inequalities. So I think this is a this is this is a this is a challenging question, and I do think um, obviously I'm on the side of of being able to do more rather than less. Um, I think there 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 are obviously some theoretical limits. Although you know I'm pushing against a literature that says you can't have any real differentials, or you're going to you're really going to lose out. And so in some ways the minimum wage, and I I. I agree with you. It's not. Um, um, it's not. Um, it's not a uh, redistribution from the various wealthiest down, right? It's actually. It's who's going to pay this is a, is a real yeah. question, and um, um, so there's a kind of workers um, versus consumers, and we might actually not know, you know, how that's going to play right. out. What what the minimum wage for me or the living wage movement in the cities, in the U.S. cities, represent was a kind of proof of concept, which is on, on, the, on the conventional and orthodox kind of Tibu theory or Paul Peterson theory, the, 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 orth, the, the, any differential in wage, wage requirements that's not matched to some right that's not matched to the cost of living or something like that is is going to have uh employers fleeing just across the border especially if there's there's um if if you have multiple local governments in a in a metropolitan area right. and in fact often you do and they will just they will hit the road unless there's something constraining them in various ways and there's not much to constrain them in in a world of um um pretty low cost mobility, right? Mm -hmm. Low cost transportation and so on. And that goes for tax rates because we do have differential tax rates. The city of New York taxes you a lot more than 
the suburbs do, right? Yep. Um, and that's the case in lots of cities. And many times people would point to that and say, that's why the place is declining. Philadelphia has a wage tax and it's a real problem. And that's that's reducing investment in the city. New York City's got to lower its taxes so that it can compete with the suburbs. Right. Same as you have to improve your schools also to get people in. Right. It's the same. These are all the same kinds of types of claims, which is that that with mobile mobile people and firms, those those folks can flee. And then you're stuck with a city of, full of people who can't flee. Right. Who have no no capacity to move or, or be mobile. That's the worry. That's the worry. That's right. That's the ultimate outcome. And that's what some would have said is what happened to cities in the United States in the 70s, right? Um, or through many decades post-World War, uh, World War II. So, I, I, again, I, going back, I see the, the living wage as a kind of proof of concept, which is actually you don't lose, you don't lose um, firms. They, they've adjusted pretty readily. You, you, your population continues to increase in these places. Um, your property values continue to increase in these places. There's there seems to be even more demand, right, for this valuable real estate where you're going to pay more taxes. And so I don't think we're up against the limit of what is possible. And part of this is, and there's a, you know, I again, I don't want to, I don't, I, 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 I try to be a, a skeptic all the way through lots of theories. But one account is that, in fact, many cities, not all cities, many cities, especially primate cities, but even some not so primate cities, have sorry, what was that? Pri- primate? primate primate cities, the the kind of New Yorks, Chicago's, uh, uh-huh. Tokyo's, London's, right? It's the big, the big boys, the, the big, big players. the big players. Yeah, um, they have so much at at this point, and this to talk about them like this should be a shock to folks who understood these cities in the seventies and eighties, right? But to talk about them in the following way, which is they have so much economic power because firms so badly want to be there. Firms and residents want to be there that they can leverage that, that, that location advantage to do lots of redistribution even more so. And here would be a kind of dramatic claim, even more so than um, the nations in which they are, hmm. right? Nations have trouble, right? Keeping their people, they're taxing. So folks are going overseas or they're moving out of the, of the nation. But in fact, the power of these, these, these global cities is such that, that firms and residents want to be there so badly that in fact, they might have more power to tax and hmm. redistribute than the national government. Now, the original, the, uh, 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 a basic account of fiscal federalism is that the subnational governments can't tax and redistribute, at least not at that all. effectively, especially not local governments. Maybe yeah. state governments can because they're big enough, but certainly the, the appropriate place for taxing and redistribution is at the national level because you, you, you can capture all your people, right? You keep right. them in. People now, even in a globe, but in a global world, in a global environment, even that's a problem, right? For mm-hmm. for it's not as big a problem, maybe, but it, that's a problem because people flee those taxing jurisdictions, and so s- nation states have trouble, right? And so folks say, well, it's hard for you to tax. So now think about the city, the cities w- which have such. Uh, locational leverage because people and firms want to be there that they're they have more power to tax and redistribute than the nation Mm -hmm. that flips the traditional and conventional account of of fiscal federalism that we've all uh, basically absorbed and boy that could be dramatic now i don't want to say it in its strongest form because i think a lot of cities are need national governments to be able to tax and and redistribute and in fact those basically as a as a as a legal and constitutional matter as a macroeconomic matter nation states are the only ones that can really print money right and run mm-hmm. deficits and and do the things that you would have to do uh, to fight recessions and so on cities can't do that because they don't have their own currency right but imagine <laughs> city states of the of the kind of you know of of London and and Tokyo and New York and Chicago and you can and these are places with enormous uh, gdps right bigger than most nations and they're they have a lot of capacity even even um even uh, as compared to nations hmm. 
Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, so let, let me just ask you one more question because we're, we're bumping up against our our time limit here. Is um, you know, given this new prominence, and this kind of folds into some of the more recent work that you've been doing, given the the, the province of these mega cities or these inc- ex- extremely important cities, but also you know even smaller cities and in, in, in structuring economic develop our our economic life, let's just say our cultural life and our social life, you know we have a funny constitutional system in in the U.S. that places an enormous amount of power at the state level rather than at the city level, and you you talk there's some really interesting discussion in the book about, you know, kind of some of our constitutional decisions and how that's affected cities and city power and, and, and the like. But my kind of big blowout question is, you know, sometimes I just feel like states are, are vestigial and things <laughs> right. in our constitutional system that, that, that like make no sense. And if we had, a, you know, kind of a, a constitutional convention, you know, which could happen. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Um, and we were really rethinking, you know, how we wanted to structure governance in the U.S. You know, like the federal government, big mega regions and cities is where we would place governance authority. And it wouldn't yeah. be at the at the state level. Um, I'm just curious your, your thoughts on that. Are, are, are states still worth anything or are they just this thing that we're kind of stuck with in the current constitution and it's actually a pretty crappy place to to locate authority yeah so uh you're 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 channeling me a little bit i'm re, 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 <laughs> i'm glad to hear you're preaching to the you're, you're preaching to the choir um so i i agree with you uh uh maybe not in the strongest version of what you're saying but uh, recent articles i've written have have essentially made this kind of claim which is that the um the states i think there there have long been uh, arguments that the us states in fact are are um a product of a, a right a flawed compromise um and now have lost their reason for being and in fact um as we as um is commonly understood now i think is the the senate is quite anti democratic and so is the the um the electoral college, and that's based on states, and um, and that distorts and skews our uh, our politics, uh, as a, politics, our national yeah. politics. That's right. And so I have been um, I've been long fighting the following fight, which is when you talk about decentralization or federalism in U.S. Uh, legal and constitutional discourse, the immediate reaction is you don't trust states, do you? <laughs> like states mm-hmm. in the South had Jim Crow and we needed civil rights laws and employment laws and anti-discrimination laws and you needed the national government to come in and um, and do the work, do that work. Um, and um, and so I say, no, it's not, it doesn't have to be about states. It can be about, it, you can be opposed to states but in favor of cities, right? And so this is the claim I make um, in a recent article about um, um, metropolitanization and the problem of states, which I think states are skewed in lots of ways. Their politics are skewed in lots of ways, similar, I think, to the national government in some ways, um, and skewed by a certain kind of anti-urbanism or an anti-city kind of, uh, uh, I think we see that at the national level, frankly, the hostility to states, the urban-rural divide that we're seeing is is a national one, but it starts in the states. And in part, um, uh, we had c- constructed state constitutions in some ways to address the urban-rural divide, um, um, especially in the, uh, in, the, in the 19th and then early part of the 20th century, where there was a fear of the big city, right? The mm-hmm. big city is going to take over and it's going to have economic and political power and we need to do various things to constrain it. Um, and so that's been a long-running uh, uh, a theme in in state state level politics, and um, we've also seen in the last um, decade um, um, uh, a rise in state level uh, preemption of local laws of city laws. And I wrote a, a piece called "The Attack on American Cities," which is kind of a dramatic title <laughs> for a law review article, but I think it it is actually. Um, um, accurate in a lot of ways, um, a rise in state legislatures deciding that all kinds of policies that the cities are uh, embracing, including, mm-hmm. by the way, quite 
prominently living wage laws in cities, um, but lots of other things too, uh, environmental protection in cities, all kinds of stuff. What we've seen is city, uh, state legislatures come after those things quite uh, aggressively. We saw it in the, in, the, in the pandemic. We saw that as well. Um, state legislatures and governors um, overriding local health and safety uh, regulations and so on. So we're seeing a lot of conflict between states and their cities. And, um, and my, one of my th- uh, sort of claims is that that um, is representative uh, of our national political life, in fact. So what we're seeing is a kind of uh, phenomena at the state city level, which has kind of reproduced itself nationally. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and so when we talk about the urban rural divide or other things like that, those are divides within states. It's not that you have blue states and red states and blue cities, uh, mostly blue cities, right? Or um, what you have is, 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 is states that are red in rural and, in, and, and um, exurban areas and are much more and are blue in their cities. And so yep. the divide, what federalism, and this is, the, this is a direct answer to your question about states and what use they are. If federalism, state-based federalism is intended to allow different kinds of places, different kinds of regions to govern themselves in their own way and to, to, to limit the impact of national or centralized or, or, or global laws on these local communities. It's not doing that work because it's the divide, the most salient political divide today is internal to states. It's between right. cities and their, and their surrounding areas. And that means you need mechanisms inside states to... Uh, uh, achieve some of the goals that federalism is supposed to achieve. And so I think our state-based federalism doesn't work in the way it was perhaps intended. It hasn't worked for a long time. And what we're seeing is, is in fact, especially uh, more recently, is that um, that results in um, occluding the actual, the, the actual divide that's, that's most salient, which is between these cities and their, and their um, and the rural areas in those states. Yeah. And, you know, for what it's worth, the uh, state level constitutional change is a heck of, of a lot more likely than uh, yes. the national level constitutional yes. change. And so yeah. that that brings me to home rule, which I'm a big advocate of. Um, and uh, home rule is often associated, can be associated with a kind of conservative or reactionary uh, 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 approach because it, it was invoked, you know, by those resisting civil rights and so on from the national government. But the way I use home rule is about this, about cities actually having the power to do these things without undue interference from their state governments. And um, that seems like a huge problem, a characteristic of the, 20, the late 20th and early 21st centuries that we should really pay a lot of attention to and doesn't get as much attention as it should. And so I've been pushing quite hard to, um, to just make that more prominent and at least in legal scholarship. Great. Well, um, much more to talk about rich, but, uh, but this has been a fascinating conversation and we've covered, uh, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, thanks so much for, uh, for uh, chatting with me today and all, all the work that you that you do on this stuff. Oh, thank, thanks so much, Mike, for having me on the on the podcast. It's it's a real pleasure.